we are starting a new series. I'm pretty psyched about it. It's our summer series, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's called AC Epic Road Trip, because everyone knows that summertime is a time for road trips, right? Like, I mean, maybe road trips weren't what they used to be where, you know, flying was a little bit more exclusive and now everybody can fly, it's no big deal, but like, like, and you used to have to go on road trips, but there's something about, even if you have the opportunity to fly, there's something cool about a road trip, right? Like, like there's something that happens when you're like, road trip, like we're road tripping, it's awesome, we make it into a verb, you don't do that, you know, I guess you could say you're flying, yeah, so you do it, okay, whatever, but like road trip's awesome, like there's something really cool that happens on a road trip. And what we're going to do um, this particular summer for the next six weeks is we're going to take a road trip, and um, you can sort of see our, our theme here. We're getting, we're getting in, the, in the right uh, vibe. Uh, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to see some of the areas that we haven't maybe been in uh, for a while. So here's the deal. Uh, we've, been, we've been really working through and casting Vision 2020, which is this uh, desire to see the amount of Christ followers double. It's connected with Church United, and we're, we're like all in on seeing our area double in those people who say yes to Jesus. And we're believing that that can actually happen uh, because Jesus promised, he's, he makes this crazy promise in, in John 14 where he's like, you're going to do what I do and you're going to do even greater things than I do. And so we're just, we're just taking God at his word. And we're believing him and we're believing that that means that we are going to have this like awesome ability, thanks to the Holy Spirit, to see the gospel go forward in greater measure than it really ever has in our time. And so we've been preaching through this year and next year, we'll continue to do that. The, the, this idea of what does it look like for Vision 2020, like a greater evangelical move, to become a, a real part of our culture. And so what we wanted to do this summer is not fully take a break from that, but do a little summer series that kind of uh, takes us on to an adventure. Uh, and so it's going to be connected to Vision 2020, you'll see here in just a second, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of an adventure and it's something different, and, uh, and we're using Hebrews 11 as our map, okay, because everyone knows that, that, that a road trip, you know, you need a map. And the idea is that we're going to be taking a road trip through the Old Testament, and we're going to be going through some of the like major players in the Old Testament, and we're going to be just kind of like road tripping through their lives and also the history of God's people. And, and, and some of you may be really familiar with that, and you might be like, oh, great, Abraham and Isaac, I know those guys. Those are like, yeah, like I love studying. Some of you might be like, who's Abraham and, and Isaac and what, who, who is that? And that, what we want to do is we wanted to create a, an environment where both, if you don't don't know who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, but if you do, it would, it would be like really encouraging to you, and it would make a lot of the name of Jesus. And so that's where we're going to go on our road trip. That's, that's where we're going to, we're going to head to the Old Testament, and we're going to bounce around through some of those major players uh, in, in the Old Testament. And I thought, man, what a cool name for this series, uh, Epic Road Trip, because obviously, like I said, in the summer, it's, uh, it's, it's a great time to go on a road trip. Now, quick show of hands. Has anybody gone on a summer road trip yet so far? Wow. Okay. All right. Awesome. Is anybody planning on going on a road trip that's coming up? All right. Okay. All right. So, so we've got some road trippers here. That's good. That's good. Um, so I've been on two. Uh, one was with my wife and daughter and son, and that was, that was you know, like a, a domesticated road trip. And then I went on an all-male road trip, which was a completely different environment. I went with my dad and my son, and uh, we had a, a, an all-boys week, actually, up in South Carolina, where my son had a baseball tournament, and we got to road trip it up there to, uh, to Myrtle Beach and back. And um, it was interesting on this road trip, because I'm reminded of things that, that don't necessarily apply anymore, like paper maps. And having to read a paper map, not that I was really young or old enough to have to read a paper map, but I remember like there would be a paper map that my parents would unfold, you know, like super unsafe while they were driving, certainly. It would block the big Lumina, you know, Chevy Lumina window thing that we would be behind. And, and then like there'd usually ensue a fight between my mom and dad because mom, she, did, she like wasn't her spiritual gift, map reading. And dad was driving. And so, you know, in those roads, you know, they're, they're so small um, on the map. And so anyways, uh, that's out. So it's, it's much easier uh, with, with, with that. And um, what is in, though, is I did bring, because it was a baseball 
trip. I did bring my glove. So something that we used to do on, on the road with dad and I, we would stop and we'd play catch. We'd be like eight hours in or whatever. And we'd stop and play catch. Well, I have, I'd never actually done that with my son, although like I've coached in baseball for all these years. And so we actually stopped and played catch. That was kind of cool. And, um, you know, listening to music was cool. We did all that sort of thing. And, and I guess the one thing that was new, because now I did most of the driving, Normally, I was like in some unsafe position on the floor on a road trip, you know, doing like playing games. Uh, this time, um, I did most of the driving, and, and that was cool, but I, I got a little bit concerned, uh, you know, because we were, we were doing the Myrtle Beach in one thing, which isn't horrible. I think it's like nine hours and, uh, with bathroom stops and things like that. But um, towards the end, it was like I had already had my hot caffeine, and then I had my cold caffeine, and I was like, wow. Where, where, do, where do I go next, okay? Because I was getting to that point of like really kind of, getting a little, you know, am I going to make this thing? And, and usually I don't have to go beyond a hot and a cold caffeine option. But thankfully, um, the, Lord, the Lord provided, and here we are uh, after our road trips. I hope you guys enjoy your road trips and this particular road trip. Because the, the, the common theme that you're going to see in this road trip is that it was by faith. It's by faith. That's going to be sort of our connection between Vision 2020 and, and the Old Testament. Um, you're going to see that, that there's this idea in Hebrews 11 that gets fleshed out where the author of Hebrews, although we don't exact, some people think it's Paul, we're not actually sure as to the author of, of Hebrews, but, but, but the author talks about this idea of by faith. And by faith, these people did amazing things. And so what we're going to see here is like, like the activating element of our current vision 2020 is faith. So let me just be real simple about it. If we want to see the greater things that Jesus promised, the activating element to that will be faith. If we live without faith, that promise remains uh, estranged to us. It's still good and it will still happen, but we will not be walking in the effectiveness of it. Faith is the bridge that allows us to then walk in the promises of God. Are you, are, does that make sense? So the promises are so, still good, but when, when you're walking without faith, when, when you're walking in unbelief, then you become sort of like a distant stranger to the promise. God's still going to make good on his promise somehow, some way. That's his sovereign grace, but you miss out. And so we don't want you to miss out. And so this is all about like, let's, let's look at some people who didn't miss out, although they were super imperfect, so I love them. They didn't miss out because faith was the activating element. Just a few thoughts about, about faith. Um, th this, is, this is what one of the commentators uh, says about uh, faith, an enduring word. Uh, he, he says it's like uh, uh, an eyesight. He says faith is, is akin to like physical eyesight. So physical eyesight allows you to see things in the natural world and know what they are. You can actually um, understand the natural world through physical eyesight. Faith is like the, that eyesight sense, but into the unseen world. Faith is, is very much like your eyes that get to see the unseen things. So I, I'm not sure why you're here today, like whether you, you, know, you had a choice in it or not, or like you're just kind of checking the things of faith out. But without faith, you can't see the things we're going to talk about. They're sort of like the glasses that you need to put on to see the unseen world. And the scriptures is all about the unseen world. It plays out in the scene but there's a ton of things happening in the unseen world that you won't be able to see without faith. The commentator says it's, it's, it's like the thing that helps us to see God's hand or the unseen. Um, another, another uh, com he continues by saying, it's not as though it's faith or reason, it's that faith just simply goes beyond reason. It doesn't stop at reason. Reason doesn't contradict faith. It simply, it, it, it's one of those things where reason can only go so far and then faith takes you beyond it. Well, uh, let's, as, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Hebrews and Genesis. So if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, um, we'll have some of the verses for you uh, up, up there. We're going to be uh, just kind of giving you a, a broad understanding, I guess, if you will, about what faith looks like. So uh, the first three verses of Hebrews uh, in chapter 11, we'll do that, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, our, our subject of the day. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 eventually. And so um, the author, as we said, is unknown, but the, uh, the audience is not unknown. The audience that this letter goes to is very simply put, discouraged Christians. 
discouraged Christians, Christians who are um, maybe not thriving. Uh, I don't need to see your hands, but simply when I even begin to talk about that, those of you who are not thriving, you're, I, I feel like the Lord pulls you in in moments like this. Those of you who are struggling, those of you who would not define the season of your life as flourishing, um, maybe joy has escaped you, happiness of your heart is a distant memory, uh, it's just a difficult time, and maybe, maybe there's even thoughts of like just bouncing on the whole Jesus thing. I don't know where you might be, but that was the crowd this was written to. It was written to a crowd that was not like all summer road trippy, like, hey, let's go, this is going to be awesome. It was written to a crowd that was like kind of barely hanging on. So, if that's you, you are in really good company. If it's not you, and you are abounding, and you are flourishing, and things are awesome, then they're just going to get awesomer, okay? I don't know if that's a word or not. It's okay. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Let's just start right here. First of all, it's the assurance of things that are hoped for. And, and when we use the word hope, it doesn't mean like, uh, fingers crossed, I, I hope, you know, the Red Sox turn around this season. That's not the kind of hope we're talking about. We're talking, I see that Sox hat in the back, by the way, appreciate that. We're talking about the kind of hope that is secure, confident, but things that haven't happened yet. Things that haven't happened yet. Almost like um, for those of you who might be pregnant right now, and maybe you're like in your, in your, your, your last trimester, and you're like, there it is, Right? I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure it's coming. Look, there it is. I haven't met it yet, but I'm, my, my hope is that he or she is coming. Well, well it's more than just kind of like a, we hope we get pregnant. No, you can, you're, you're confident of it. You just haven't held your baby yet. That's the kind of hope we're talking about. Faith is the assurance of these things that we know about Jesus, the convictions of things not seen. Do you understand from the get why faith is so important? Because we're about to enter into a journey when following Jesus where there's, you're asked to see a lot of unseen things. Like, it's, you can't really be a Christian and, and not have the ability to see the unseen. You could be a student of Christianity, and you could know about somebody named God, but to actually know and follow the living Jesus, you have to be able to see the unseen. You have to be able to, to have this assurance of things that you don't have quite yet. But rest assured, you're in good company. You're in good company, and we're going to see that over the next six weeks. For by it, now here's what faith can do. Not only will it allow you to see the unseen, for by it, people of old received their commendation. Next verse, please. By faith, okay, and so their commendation, so like way to go. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So just really simple, we're just talking about like creation, and and if you look, it's like you, you, faith will tell you either that this is just kind of like, um, you know, random matter. That's not what faith, un, like unbelief would tell you, well, these things just kind of happened. They just kind of like showed up. Faith tells you there's intelligent design behind this. Although I didn't see the creator create, I'm believing that the way things are ordered beckons, like calls for a creator. And so faith helps you um, to see that. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at how faith actually like opens up your whole Christian walk. It opens up your whole life to the person of Jesus, and it changes things. Like, mo- like today, like I'm believing, even in this moment right now, that God is going to be giving you faith. I ask it in the name of Jesus that you would receive faith even right now that you don't have so that you will be able to see things you've never seen before. I'm just going to ask that over you right now and even of myself. And now, and now like, like now let's watch. Let's watch today, even by the time we're done, Let's watch today if God didn't do something by giving you faith and allowing you to see some things that maybe you've never seen before. Let's look forward to it with assurance that God can do these sort of things. And so we're going to look here at at a person called Abraham who lived by faith. Um, And I love his faith. His faith was so sloppy. I love it. I love, I love this guy. My favorite guy in the whole Old Testament world is, is definitely David. But Abraham's awesome too. He was slow he was sloppy. He made a mess of things. And, and God writes about him in Hebrews 11 as like a founding father. Like, look at this guy. Love that about Abraham. So I wanted to kind of give you the Yelp version of Abraham 
Um, as you guys know, Yelp, it kind of gives you some reviews. It's kind of like, you know, I've been on uh, some week-long vacations where I've been in South Carolina. My daughter had a volleyball tournament, so we were in Orlando. And Yelp is super helpful, right? It can tell you things that other people know about a particular place, right? It's kind of, so, so you go to Yelp and, and you look. So this is just a brief Yelp on Abraham. You might know it. You might not know it. I'm going to give you kind of like some, some just brief broad strokes, and then we're going to look at the scriptures as to like wh- what these actually mean to at least some degree. Now listen, the whole series could be on Abraham, okay? So if you're out there and you are like, you're like a Bible junkie, okay? You're like a theological nerd in an awesome way, okay? That's not a, that's not a, by the way, that's not a um, insult. That's a, that's a compliment. If you like, if you're a theological nerd, you're like, you just drink this stuff in. You might be upset that we're only spending one Sunday on Abraham. Remember, we're, it's a road trip. Okay, we're, we're traveling through, okay? So I'm going to give you some stuff, hopefully, that you can just nerd out on, on your own throughout the week. But, but in our time, we got to just kind of like, we're, we're taking a, a brief journey here. And so here's kind of the Yelp version of Abraham. So you, good to know, he's kind of considered Father Abraham, okay? Father Abraham. How many of you have a song that's like right on the tip of your tongue? You Sunday school people, you. If you don't have a song, that's super cool. Then that means you probably met Jesus later in life. Awesome. We love you both and all. But there's this song, the father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all, that was kind of weak, but that's okay. That's okay. Do a time check. It's only, it's 11, guys. It's 11. It should have been a little stronger than that. Anyways. So he's considered like the father of faith. People would consider them, him the father of actually maybe even a couple of faiths. Um, Christians would claim him as like the, the, the father of, of faith and what it means to be declared righteous by faith. And um, the Israelites would claim him and, and even the Muslims would look to him. And, and th- there's, like, he's kind of a central figure in this world of uh, religion, if you will. And, and so it's just kind of good to know that he's a, he's a pretty sought after guy historically. Um, he received a covenant uh, a covenant, a, um, a promise. It's different than a contract. So a covenant is a promise from God. And uh, basically, it's, it's based on God's integrity and not the integrity of the person receiving the covenant. That's one of the differences between um, um, covenant and contract. Contracts are based on if you do your job, I'll do mine. But covenant has more of like a promise feel to it. Now, some of God's covenants had different natures, but, but there's an Abrahamic covenant. There's an Abrahamic promise that he gets, which involves him getting promised a couple of things. Land is one of the things that he gets promised. Um, a, a descendant being in the line of the Messiah. Many descendants is one of the things that he gets promised and, and um, that, that he would be a blessing to many nations. Um, and so he, he gets promised these things, and we'll, we'll look at some of these things as we go on. These are really big because Abraham becomes a, a huge marker in the line of, in the lineage of Jesus, okay? And, and, and so he's going to produce um, a son that will be in line with the Messiah. That's an awesome promise to receive. And then Isaac. You might know Abraham and Isaac and some of that story, and we're going to touch on a little bit of that story and see what God has to share with us um, about Abraham and Isaac and the dynamic of their relationship. But you might just know that he was the father of Isaac and this like crazy thing happened between Abraham and Isaac where he was called to sacrifice Isaac. And then God was like, no, don't do that. Okay, so you might know that. It's good to know. We're going to touch, we're going to touch on it a, a little bit here uh, towards the end. And so that's kind of the Yelp version of Abraham. Let's, let's dive into some of these actual passages. Now, Hebrews is going to be our map for it. So if we can go back to Hebrews uh, beginning in verse 8. We'll go 8 through 12. Here we'll see this. This is kind of what we're going to see, what, how, how faith affected Abraham. And then we'll look at some of those Genesis passages, okay? Um, so Hebrews 8, by faith, so this is, this is how faith kind of opened up the life of Abraham and the promises of God. By faith, Abraham obeyed. So we're going to see from the beginning that one of the markers of whether you're living by faith or not is, is your obedience. Faith and obedience go, go hand in hand. So as you believe God, you actually obey God. So if you have an obedience problem, you do not have a behavioral situation. You have a belief situation. Let's just start, start off right there. 
This is not behavior modification. Let's be better at a few certain things. This is if I find myself continuing to go back to pornography or I find myself continuing to go back to my drug of choice or I find myself continuing to suck deeply the words of gossip, whatever the case may be, that doesn't mean you got to get better at that situation. It means there's something about God you're not actually believing, which is resulting in that crazy behavior. Let's look at what you're believing about God, because as Abraham, by faith, believed God, he then obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going, okay? And so the first kind of thing here we see is that, that there's a, this is the kind of faith that actually moves people into different um, spaces. Uh, keep going, please. By faith... He went to live in the land of promise. Okay, so this, this references his first promise. Remember, we said that Abraham was given um, a covenant, and he was given a, a few promises. One of them was land. And so by faith, how did he receive the promise? He received it by faith. Um, and so he went to live in the land by faith. And as a foreigner in the land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, these are descendants, heirs with him of the same promise. So they got the same promise. But it, it didn't become a reality until they started walking in faith. Faith. Let's continue. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Okay, so even though he was given the promised land, he knew there was a greater promised land coming. He knew that there was something even better than Canaan. There was something even better than the promised land that was coming. And so he walked in faith and he received some of the promise, but the fullness of the promise was yet to come. That's really cool because it didn't seem to affect Abraham's faith. That's big. Abraham received the promise in part, but not in full. And yet it didn't affect his faith. He still continued to walk in faith knowing that he would receive the promise in full one day, even if it wasn't while he was still breathing in this particular body. And when I say it didn't affect his faith... There was effects to it, but he kept going. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she, since she considered him faithful who had promised. So Sarah is his wife. She's awesome. She's awesome. And she, by faith, was able to get pregnant, although she was super old. They were promised this child, and they were promised descendants, but they had no kids at the time, and they were pretty super old. And so it took faith from both Sarah and Abraham to believe that God would be true to his word in order for them to walk in the fullness of the promises of God. Therefore, from one man, as him as good as dead, meaning he was super old, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So when we sing, Father Abraham had many sons, what we're saying is that if you are a child of faith, if you are a child of the Father through faith in Christ, you are a descendant of Abraham and even Sarah. You, you're, you have helped to fulfill this promise that he would have many descendants because we walk in the same lineage as Abraham by faith. Now, there's this other, there's this other part by faith that we'll hit, and then we'll look in the, in the Old Testament as to where this comes up. By faith... Abraham. Now, what I'm doing here, as you can tell in Hebrews chapter 11, is we're skipping to just the parts on Abraham. And then as we go through this, we'll, we'll focus on particular characters, and then we'll look back in the Old Testament and see where these things come up. Hebrews 11:17 through 18. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. That's his son. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Let me just pause here. Here's the deal. I can't fully explain what was happening when Abraham was asked to, to sacrifice Isaac. I don't fully get it. Um... We know very clearly that, that God does not receive human sacrifice and that, that in that culture, the pagan gods did, and, and God was very clear that like, that was not his heart in the matter. But it would be unbiblical for me to say that God did not ask Abraham to sacrifice his son as a test of faith. Like, that, that, that's, that seemed to be what God was doing, and 
And I just want to say, as just kind of like put it out there, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. Like I, I'm taking God at his word that that happened and that that's the way it rolled out and that God used it for good and we're going to see a picture of the gospel in it. And this would be maybe something for you guys to like work through throughout the week if you desire more like theology behind this because we know that the, the heart of God is of love and, and for life and for flourishing. And, and yet there's this moment that's really hard for some of us to accept in the Old Testament where God's like, I, I'm asking you to sacrifice your son. Now he doesn't let him do it and we know that that was not God's heart. I just want to be clear with you guys that that's, that's a... I don't know what the words are, but it's like hard for me to get my full mind around. Are you with me on that? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I know it was all good, and I know that God's always good. It's just that some things in the scripture, if you get real with them, can, can sometimes be like, man, I gotta, God's got to do some more work even in my own heart as I understand that. I hope, I hope that's okay with you guys. So, um, so here's the deal. He considered, this is, what, this is what Abraham thought, right? He considered that God was able even to raise him, that's Isaac, from the dead, from which, figuratively, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So Abraham went ahead with this offering, believing that he's like, oh, I know God's going to raise Isaac back up, so he's going to make good on his promise, even if I have to take him out right now. That's pretty awesome faith in the giver of the promise and not the details of the plan. It's pretty awesome faith in the giver of the promise and not the details of the plan. If you're like me, I just probably even shared it. I like the details. That would give me maybe more faith in the giver. But we don't always get the details. All right, so let, let's go, right? Like, let's see in, in Genesis where some of these things come up and what this have, has to do with us uh, uh, today. And, and so the first stop we're going to is uh, Abraham in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12. And so write these down, if you would, please. Genesis 12, 1 through 4, 15, 22. These are great places, and you could even start maybe in Genesis like around 7 and read through chapter 22 if you wanted to this week, man, like, or even beyond. You'll see that there's a narrative here. Um, great, great stuff to give you a fuller picture of what was happening again. This is a journey through where we're seeing by faith how these things came to life. And, and, but, but this is, this is kind of like where we're going to look, look for today um, as, we, as we go on our road trip. And in Genesis 12, um, we see here that, that this is going to be a faith that moves people, specifically Abraham, from the known to the unknown. From the known to the unknown. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to just kind of follow along with me. These verses won't be up there, uh, but I will read them to you so that um, you can follow along either with me, with your ears or your eyes, however you want to do this. So in Genesis 12, here's where we, here's, here's where we pick it up. Now, I want you to know that um, God had already made a promise to Abraham. This is not the first time that God's promising things to Abraham. This is kind of like a reminder uh, of, of some of these promises. Now, now, the Lord said to Abram, that was his name before he got it switched, and part of the switching of his name goes with his journey. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Part of the promise. I will bless you. Part of the promise. And make your name great. Part of the promise. So that you will be a blessing. Part of the promise. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Part of the promise we talked about. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. No baby yet, 75. Now, you know, I don't know what you think of modern medicine and things like that, but 75, you're probably, you're probably pushing it, right? Like even, even if you're going to live by faith today and, and, you know, like 75, no baby, but you're promised a baby and you're promised all these descendants, you might have some questions about, about the, the situation. You might be wondering, wow, this is going to be really creative, God. Well, so I don't know all that was happening in Abram, Abram to Abraham's mind. I do know this, that he had enough faith to move him. This was a faith that actually moved Abraham from one place into the promised land. 
God did not tell him specifically how he was going to get there. He didn't tell him the, the obstacles he was going to face on the way. He just said, I want you to go. And, and it's important that you understand, it's not the first time that God asked Abraham or Abram to go. This is God reminding Abraham, hey, you need to go. You need to complete the fulfillment of where I want you. I love this because this is, this is reminding me that even though this is a, a faith that moves people from known to unknown, oftentimes it can be slow and it can be in stages. It's not like the first time Abram, you know, and I'll just start calling him Abraham from here on out. Abraham heard the promise of God. He got up and he ran to Canaan. No, he's like on a journey of obedience. And he's becoming more obedient the longer he journeys with this living God. That should be encouraging to you. That's what we call the process of sanctification. That's why it's called a process or a journey. The more you get to know the living Jesus, the more you actually can take him at his word. Well, Abraham was experiencing much the same as, as we do. And so, and so what we see here is that Abraham had a faith that actually took him from what he knew to what he did not. I want to give you um, a little bit of the background of what that can feel like. When you're, when you're moving from something you know to something you don't. It was about, I guess, it'll be nine years in September that um, we planted this church and there were nine of us who were a part of the core team that felt like God wanted us to move from something that we knew, something very comfortable, something very good, to something unknown. And in that process, I can share with you, um, although it's hard for me to remember yesterday, so I'm, I'm doing my best to remember nine years ago, but these were certainly some of the thoughts that probably myself and the team faced as we were mo moving from the known to the unknown. Sort of a behind-the-scenes look. The first one is you've got the wrong guy. <laughs> you can expect when God asks you to move from the known to the unknown, it doesn't matter what it is. It might be relationally. It might be in service. It might be to start a church, start a business, go back to school, marry this person, have kids. It might be to foster. It might be to, I don't know. I don't know. But when God asks you to move from the known, what you know, to the unknown, oftentimes you're going to think that God has the wrong girl, that he dialed up the wrong number, and that this is, this is not valid. I hear what you're saying, Father. I understand what you're saying, but you've got the wrong person. And so the reason I tell you that is to simply encourage you that when you begin to hear the call to move from what you know to what you don't know, I mean, maybe it's just like going to Bible study or getting in a DNA group or, or starting to read your scripture more regularly. You're going to have some reaction that says you've got the wrong person. You've got the wrong place. You've got the wrong place. You see, we were in Boca, Okay. And in Boca, we knew how to function as a big church. We knew how to pay our bills. We knew how to get people to watch kids. We knew how to get small groups going. We knew how to do cool marketing. We knew how to, we knew our stuff. It was like we had some church swag, right? Like, yeah, dude, we like, do sir, you yeah, well, I don't know. Like, we got like a thousand people. This is a great. You got to get there early on Christmas Eve, you know. And so if you were a part of the crew that we were a part of, you felt like you knew what was happening, and you could actually go out and do a breakout at a conference and talk about it. And then God called you to move to Delray. Delray, now I'm from Delray. I grew up in Delray. I spent my life mostly from five years old to 44, which I am right now, mostly in Delray, Boynton a little bit, and then Delray. I was like, this is, this is my area. But I don't, Delray? I mean, what are we going to do in Delray? Like, we, we know how to do things in Boca, but Delray... Here's what I know about Del Rey. Del Rey has this like really beautiful diversity that I don't exactly know how to like enter into. Del Rey has this beautiful um, recovery community that I don't exactly know how to enter into. Del Rey is new space and I don't really know the church scene there in Del Rey. And like, maybe, maybe it's the wrong place. Maybe, maybe this, is, this is not the right place for us to go. 
If God starts to call you to move from the known to the unknown, you might be able to expect some of that like wrong, da- like wrong guy, wrong girl, but maybe it's also like, no, maybe I didn't hear you right because I don't know what it's going to be like over there, so I-, I can't go there. I'm not fit for there. And finally, it might be the wrong, the wrong part of your life. Maybe you're thinking when you start to hear God say, hey, like, I want you to move in this direction, a strong urge can come up in your life where you're like, this is not the right time in my life for this. Like when I get things settled or I get this or things, things get to a certain point, then I can go and obey you. But until then, I'm going to obey you in what I know. It's much, it's, it's much like I can understand that here. Now, there might be some times when those are valid things and you're like, need to work that out with the Lord and in the community of the saints. But you also might be like us where you just need to buy faith Get the heck up and go. Um, what else did he do? Well, he also, he also took God at his word. Look at the next uh, passage that we'll see here, Genesis 15. Genesis 15, 1 through 6 says uh, this, and this is, this is under the theme of it's, it's a faith that takes God at his word. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be great. This is right after Abram had, had defeated some, some like evil dudes and there could be serious retribution. God's like, I got you. I got you. Can you understand the theme here of this journey? I got you. Keep going. I got you. Keep going. If you're discouraged here, listen to me. I got you. Keep going. Jesus. But Abram said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continued childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. He still hadn't had a kid. He's thinking that the, the, like this, this guy who's a good dude, Eleazar, is going to end up being his heir. And he's like, God, you, you promised me stuff, man. Like, you promised me a kid, and Sarah and I, well, we would really love a kid. And I don't know how we're going to be the father of many nations without a kid. Interesting. Um, 15 years away from the fulfillment of that promise. I think in this passage, if I'm, if I'm reading my notes correctly, it was at least a 15-year gap between the promise and the fulfillment. You've been waiting for anything for 15 years? Maybe. It's your company. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. It's a faith that takes God at his word. You know, I'm all for like apologetics and the defense of our faith and like the, the awesome reason that goes into why we believe what we believe. Usually on every Easter, thanks to the encouragement of John O'Brien, I go over the facts that support the bodily resurrection of Jesus. I think it's important that we are not just blind faith jumpers that are like, yeah, just, you know, God says it, I'm, that's all I need. But there is a point when we have to learn to take God at his word. There is a point when apologetics and reason and faith and facts and history and all those sort of things that point to Jesus like radically, there is a point when you have to leave all of that reason and all of those amazing logistics that point to the resurrected Christ and point to a life of faith and there will be times when that does not touch your anxiety. And that does not touch your addiction, and it does not touch your depression. And here you are. And here that is, and that sounds super good for the dude who's teaching Sunday school, but it doesn't affect my reality. You know what you're going to need to do? You're probably going to need to take God at his word. You're probably being called to walk by faith and take God at his word. Abraham does this, models this for us. 
and he becomes the father, in a sense, lowercase f, of our faith. He's the fa- father of faith. It says here, look, listen, at the bottom of this passage, it says, he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. This is what the whole church is based on. That truth. That we can simply, watch this, because of the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, be saved. That's what we base this whole thing on is that it's by faith that you are made right with God. It's not by your effort. It's not by your earning. It's not by your righteousness. It's by you believing that the Father placed your sin and mine on the Son and punished him in your place, that he died your death and my death, and that on the third day he overcame your sin and can forgive you. When you believe that, When you accept that as reality, you are made righteous. When you turn from all of the the striving of your self-righteousness and get to this point where you're like, man, I just believe that it's through faith alone and Christ alone and your grace alone, the Lord forgives you and says you are righteous forever. You don't have an improved righteousness. You now have my righteousness. Well, we see here Abraham modeling this for us. You know, some of you may be checking out Jesus. You've you've heard the gospel. You've heard that you're a sinner and that outside of Christ, you will spend eternity in hell separated from God. You've heard that. It doesn't affect you. You're like, I don't even believe in hell and I'm not sure I believe in sin. You've heard that your righteous acts don't measure up, and you're like, yeah, but I, I feel good about being a good person. You've heard that Jesus died in your place, and on the third day overcame sin and overcame death, and you're like, yeah, but, but like, I don't, that, that doesn't affect me. And you've heard that you can simply turn from yourself and place your trust in Christ and be forgiven and made righteous, just like Abraham did just like I did as a 13-year-old, just like many of you have done, just like the friends who keep inviting you. You've heard that, and it's kind of like far from you. So I'm here to tell you that you don't need to hear the gospel again. You don't need a more emotional song at the end, and you don't need another book on the, on the facts of the faith. If you're that person, you need to take God at his word period. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that that happens even in this moment. So finally, here's what we see about Abraham, and we, we, look, we look and make application to our own life. It's a faith that surrenders good for great. It's a faith that surrenders good for great. And we, we see this here um, in Genesis 22, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the passage, but this is the passage where um, Abraham, a little bit before, and then we get into it here, Abraham's asked to, to sacrifice his son Isaac. And um, in, this, in the beginning of this passage, uh, I think it's, I, I want to at least read to you these verses because I think they're, they give you the heart of God here. In verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me and Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up I love this this is you this is you we're Isaac you understand that right Like, based on the sinfulness of my heart, I need to get on the altar before a holy and righteous God. You may not hear much about this, but I got to just tell you, you, in, in the perfection and holiness of God, we should be on the altar saying, God, I know you're loving, but I know you're just. So you can't compromise your justice, so let me have it. And God would have every right to let you have it for eternity, just like Isaac almost got it. But God, in his love, and his passion, and his desire from you. He comes in, and he is a rescuer. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't pour it out on Casey, Father. Jesus gets on that altar and says, I will gladly, for the joy set before me, take 
what had Casey's name on it. I will take it. And we see that Abraham was willing to surrender something good like his son for something great like the person of God. This foreshadows exactly what Jesus would do, where he would surrender his rights. He would surrender his power. He would surrender everything he could to defend himself for something great, which is the joy set before him to call you and me family and to obey the Father. And so as we close and the team comes up, it would be, it would be my heart that you would begin to think through some of these things that Abraham did. Because in your story, Abraham will, he will remain sort of like a cool biblical character unless, unless you take God at his word and begin living with Jesus as the, as the hero of your story. See, there's, here, here's kind of the, the connection every week that we're looking to make. By faith, Jesus becomes the hero of our story. You see, because Jesus, look at, this, look at this last slide here. Look at this last slide. There's these three words that we're encouraging you guys to think through today. And we're going to have some prayer partners after communion where maybe, maybe you might want to process this with somebody or, or be prayed over in this way. This idea that, that faith is a faith that, that moves you from the known to the unknown. And maybe there's some of you here today that need to take a move from the known, from the comfort of what you have and what's going on, which is, it's not bad, but, but God's calling you into the unknown. He's calling you into further obedience in a particular area. I don't know what it is, but I know that God's bringing that up probably in your heart right now. Maybe some of you need to actually just believe God. Just believe his word. Maybe you're separated from all the truth and the, the, the truth of the scriptures and the facts, man, it, it seems distant from you. And you're just being asked to take God at his word. I encourage you to take God at his word based on his character and what we're about to celebrate. And maybe some of you, you're being asked to surrender something good for something great. I walked through this in my own season of life recently. Some of you may know Cade. He's our beautiful uh, little boy who's now four years old. Man, Cade didn't have the easiest year. It was just rough trauma being separated from his mom. We adopted him, and um, man, it just came out in a lot of anger and a lot of frustration and a lot of, it was just like a lot of pain that a little three-year-old doesn't fully know how to express besides just getting super angry and, and just trying some stuff in his wake. And I was trying, I think I was, I think I was probably trying to be God. You ever try to be God for your kids? It's like the worst. Super exhausting. No good at it. He, we get these reports from him after school every day, and then we kind of like grill him on how he did at school. Like, I, even saying this, I don't even believe in, in this stuff, but I was doing it. You ever, you ever find that? You're like, I don't believe in that. I would never tell you to do it, but I'm getting good at it. It's not a good place to be. So we would get these reports from his teacher daily, and then we'd grill our little three-year-old because he had to be better. Because I don't know that we, we were patient enough for him to be able to work out all the trauma that it's probably going to take a lifetime for him to work out because he's not with his biological mother. Like, I, I, I don't, I, I, we were just like rushing or getting impatient and frustrating and like, man, you can't do this to our life. You got to change. And so we were stepping in and we were being God. We were like, we would, we were like double disciplining. Like, it was just crazy stuff that we were doing. And, um, thankfully, I have a friend who just loves grace he loves grace and he loves me. His name's Dan. And he was like, pretty much like, bro, what are you doing? And there came a point when I realized that it wasn't as though my efforts needed to switch, but I needed to surrender my son. I needed to take my son, which was good, and choose the greater, which was allowing God to be who he was and surrender my son up to God. And the healing and the power and the resurrection beauty that my son is now experiencing from that season has been radically amazing. But I had to surrender him and 
quit trying to be his God. That might be your situation this morning. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come up front. We'll keep playing a little bit. Um, you might be here and, and there might be something in your life where you need to move in or on. We, we just encourage you to come forward and share that with one of our prayer partners and receive some prayer for that. Uh, maybe you need to take God at his word. That's been a struggle for you maybe and it's just been like, man, I, it's, I, it's, you've been struggling to take God at his word. Like, I know what you say. I, I just haven't been walking in, in faith in that. You know, sometimes God does things when people pray for you that seems to happen outside of just you trying to struggle on your own. So I'd encourage you to come forward and receive prayer over that. And maybe some of you just need to surrender something. It's something good. It's not like horrible, but you just need to surrender it. I would encourage you to come forward and uh, be, be prayed for and share that with a prayer partner. And, uh, we'd, lo we'd love to do that for you. And so we've got one here and one here. I'm going to give you the benediction. If you feel comfortable in receiving the benediction, you can um, hold your hands like this. If not, that's okay. And I'll just uh, speak it upon you. Now may the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God who calls us to himself by faith through grace in Christ alone, may that God make his face to shine upon you, give you peace, power, and the love of his heart. Amen and amen. Love you guys.